Good morning. This is Professor David Weiss speaking again on behalf of our continuation of series and podcasts for informative education, uh, both from uh, New Jersey and around the world through New Jersey City University. Uh, today's discussion is an economic one. It will be uh, covering what we refer to as pandemic economics, uh, but it's more both a historical context as well as a current one, and where we'll see where we'll see economic policy as well as growth, uh, and addressing both geopolitical as well as domestic uh, uh, obstacles, as well and new challenges and new uh, structures uh, in the coming uh, years. Tonight, today we have. Uh, our two esteemed uh, colleagues of mine. One is the chairman of our business management department at New Jersey City University, Professor John Donnellan. Welcome, good morning. Good morning, David. And we also have Professor John Lasky, who is uh, one of our um, more um, seasoned uh, professors that's been at our university for a long time and uh, is uh, uh, really, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, both practice, which both gentlemen have, as well as uh, theory and being in the world of both banking, finance, manufacturing collectively. We have a, a, a dearth of, uh, of memory data and knowledge and understanding. So this will be an exciting discussion today. So um, I'd like to start with um, Professor Donnell and if uh, about a question uh, that I have, let's, let's start a little bit, uh, Professor, with um, your background, just so that uh, the, the audience has a little bit of understanding briefly about where you came from before you joined the university and dedicated your life towards education, students, and professional development. Yeah, thank you, David. Well, basically, I spent quite a bit of years, actually, uh, half a lifetime, um, on Wall Street working for uh, J.P. Morgan in a variety of different roles, product management, uh, in charge of large uh, departments looking at the actual debt crisis that we went through. And then I transitioned to the academic world, where I have been at uh, NJCU for, I guess, since 2013. It's a great, great school, great departments. And I'm also a Fulbright Fellow. I just literally got back, I think David might mention that later, from uh, Finland, basically, because the State Department has declared a level four and we had to leave. So, But first off, I'd like to let everybody know out there, be safe, and my thoughts go with our first responders. Well, thank you very much, John. And, um, you know, uh, as I move into Professor Lasky on his background for a moment, which is also uh, entrepreneurship and, uh, and formalistic as well in many ways historically, I'll point out that, uh, John, that you've actually done two Fulbrights, unfortunately, uh, uh, in Finland. So we, we'll, we'll, we'll actually have a little bit of time in our what I'll call geopolitical conversation, since I, I think you really have a real handling and footing on, on what is happening in Finland, which is a little bit of a, a prism into the EU sort of region. So we'll save that for part of our discussion. Professor Lasky, tell us a little bit about yourself. A little bit about self is that uh, after- In your career, uh, the, before uh, and, 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 and academically, of course. And academically, yes, I know. And I, I didn't miss the reference about being old. I, I caught that. <laughs> <laughs> so Seasoned. Seasoned. <laughs> I went to work for, um, I, I've had a couple of different uh, uh, lives, you might say. I worked in uh, manufacturing. Uh, I've uh, obviously worked in, uh, you know, different Wall Street capacities and uh, then higher ed. And mm -hmm. manufacturing, really, when I got out of the service, uh, I started with a company, one of the oldest machine tool manufacturers uh, in this country, mm -hmm. uh, Brown and Sharp Manufacturing, uh, was recruited away for the best of reasons, a lot of money. Uh, to, at the time, the third largest trading company in Japan, which is now arguably the largest, hmm. uh, Matabeni Corporation. And, uh, you know, we did uh, a whole bunch of factory automation uh, systems, et cetera, et cetera, for the Fortune 200 companies on the planet. Uh, following that, uh, I did a, uh, a stint with my own business, uh, so very entrepreneurial, related to manufacturing and uh, robotics and systems and so forth. And from there, it was Wall Street, uh, which uh, starting as a broker, so street level uh, retail broker, and then moving on into some other things. I work for Merrill Lynch for uh, Citicorp Investment Services, part of Citibank, of course, and a company called Northeast Securities, a little boutique firm out on Long Island. And that led to uh, 
you know, long convoluted story, but led to teaching in higher ed. And uh, here I am. And I, uh, by the way, work for uh, Dr. Dun Allen. <laughs> as, we, as we both do. <laughs> so um, my first question will be an open-ended question. Either of you can take it. Um, you know, when we, when we look back first, and we'll start this from a beginning process, and we'll take a, a point of um, the open door policy of, of, of the Nixon era and the Henry Kissinger sort of doctrine of uh, working through the economic uh, elements of diplomacy uh, that led to really this China relationship that began in the you know, 70s and, and certainly then morphed into the early 80s uh, during the, uh, the recession of the early 80s that helped both um, the United Kingdom as it was losing a lot of uh, manufacturing. Uh, in fact, things were dormant all over the place during Margaret Thatcher's first term. And as Ronald Reagan was coming into the White House, how, how, how do you perceive at that point in that reflection of time, how it started to then build and morph itself as we, we entered the last part of the decade of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s? You know, from my perspective, and, and in that time frame, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I was very much involved in, uh, you know, manufacturing and, and so forth. And that was really a transition point, in a sense, and not to sound too cynical, but in a sense, what I was doing was uh, helping firms eliminate jobs to maintain, uh, you know, in a sustainable way, their, their competitive edge. Uh, I'll use a domestic example. Uh, Eastman Kodak was one of my larger domestic mm. clients. And, you know, again, unlike uh, some non-nation state firms, Eastman Kodak had a lot of the same, I'll call them issues, as the General Motors of the planet, et cetera, the Boeings and so forth, which is legacy costs. So, you know, we hear sometimes that, uh, well, General Motors employees make $75 now. That's nonsense. Nobody there, uh, you know, certainly on the line is making $75 an hour. But when you cost this out, what their labor cost is, be it $42 an hour, $35 an hour, $26 an hour, uh, they're, they're carrying the costs, uh, you know, per labor hour of all the retirees. So these legacy costs really uh, dating back to the idea of defined uh, benefit plans versus defined contribution plans became a big liability. So, you know, back in this time frame, what I did uh, through factory automation and everything was to eliminate headcount, eliminate workers to allow these firms to be competitive. Well, all that did is buy time. That was a bridge. That was a short term bridge because by the mid eighties, early nineties, even that wasn't enough to compete with, and I mean this in quotes, the China price. So <clears throat> firms began, you know, and, and big phrase of the time, offshoring, you know, for competitive, you know, blah, blah, blah. So offshoring. Well, you know, that is, and for, for entirely, arguably, business reasons, a good thing to do. But the result was this, this sucking sound, you know, this kind of, mm. and what was being sucked out was the manufacturing base. Mm -hmm. And I, I was even part of that, you know, in, in my own firm, which I uh, started after working for some of these more major firms, uh, part of my job was to go into some of these, I'll call them legacy manufacturing firms, buy up for literally pennies on the dollar great big machines of, of the industrial revolution type. I mean, great big boring mills, garage size milling machines and so forth. Disassemble them, package them, containerize them and send them to China. Mm -hmm. China takes the machinery, renovates it, improves it, and now starts to make, and, and I'll, I'll give you the shorter version of the answer, everything there that we used to make here. And, and, and maybe I'll open this up to uh, Dr. Dinellen. Mm -hmm. As a result of that end result, what was from the capital markets and from finance, which is where you were mm -hmm. hubbed mm -hmm. um, as you started to grow your career uh, in different functionalities uh, to, to, to where you got in your life, mm 
Um, how is how is finance sort of adapting to that that new period of time at that moment? Well, back on Wall Street, it was very attractive what Dr. Lasky was saying to be able to see the offshoring or the outsourcing to a less expensive uh, region. Um, we would, without question, even at J.P. Morgan, send our software development from Delaware to uh, Bangalore, India. Why? Because they do it cheaper and they do it better. So it was a common practice to outsource. And when companies like a J.P. Morgan or, or big companies at the time, like an AIG, went in for risk assessment, they would look to determine exactly what you were saving because that was part of the entire paradigm back. It was the Gordon Gecko era where things were leveraged by outscalor, where there was consolidation. The Rust Belt came from all of this. I mean, and, and we created a, a, at that time without knowing it, we thought we were doing the right thing because we were making money hand over fist, but we helped uh, create where we are today. Interesting. And, and if, if we sort of continue that narrative into the 1990s, um, and maybe I'm gonna flip back to John and, and then I'm gonna ask Professor Donnell and sort of pick up from that finance perspective of, of the end result. When we talk about the economic policies that then were starting to be implemented as we were leaving this sort of manufacturing or the leftover of the manufacturing uh, age, which we'll say ended by the late 80s into what really was it, um, we started to obviously pivot into a different type of economic structure, what was referred to as a consumer-based economy. Mm -hmm. um, so how, explain and walk us through that process and, and some of those policies that were put into effect in order for that definition to actually take fold. Um, maybe we'll, we'll start there. Well, I guess, I guess I'd start with the notion that I think we all, and, and for those that maybe don't, uh, you know, a little, little bit of uh, book reading uh, during these times in economics is not a bad thing. Uh, if we recognize that something like 70% of our economy, of, of GDP, is really consumer driven, uh, you know, and, and of course we could say, well, okay, 70% of aggregate demand, which is roughly equivalent to GDP, you know, blah, 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 blah. But the point is something around 70% is really focused on the consumer, you know, uh, uh, perceived wants and needs. And, and you know, the, the biggest factor, I think, uh, that, you know, really set the stage and, and you know, Dr. Allen pointed this out that, uh, you know, uh, uh, all of these activities led to where we are today. You know, I used to work for a guy, old guy by the name of Floyd Schultz, and he was, uh, you know, a World War II uh, aviator. He was a war hero and, and so forth. And one day we were sitting, uh, there, there was a big company uh, in, in uh, Buffalo, New York. Uh, you know, you're, you're familiar with the names, but uh, I'll, I'll, you know, Westinghouse was one of them and so forth. Right. And we're sitting at a hotel bar one night uh, having done a day's worth of business. And we were talking back and forth about the economy and about what was actually going on. And he said, you know, John, sooner or later, somebody has to make something. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's all this investment and movement and flows. And sooner or later, somebody has to make something. Well, I, I don't know who was listening besides myself, but I think we took our eye off the ball. Because we got to a point, now what I did provided a hiatus to keep domestic firms competitive for some period of time. But beyond that, it, it became just not good enough. It was a hiatus, nothing more. It was not sustainable over the long haul. So now enter the 90s. Well, now we've got an entirely different supply chain. And it was in transition when I was working with firms like Eastman Kodak. When I started with Eastman Kodak, and I think we had a discussion on this, they had something in excess of 15,000 suppliers, of which, of course, you know, I was one or attempting to be one. And we were all beating our brains in, uh, trying to compete, trying to get the next purchase order, and so on and so forth. By the time I left, years later, Eastman Kodak had a preferred supplier list of less than 1,500. 
Now, what does that tell us? Well, th this is the seminal part of offshoring and you know supply chains, tier one suppliers that bring with it an inherent responsibility, which we're seeing as a failure, by the way, today, in my view. And that responsibility is, hey, look, I'm Eastman Kodak, you want to supply X, Y, or Z. We're going to allow you to do that, but now we're more partners than we are adversarial. We're not sitting across each other, arguing over nickels and dimes on a purchase order across a big conference room table. We're on the same side. Hmm. With that comes the responsibility that if we make you this tier one supplier, this partner, you've got to protect our backside as well so that when the supply chain experiences shocks and or disruptions, you've got a plan B. And I'll fast forward to today just for a moment to make this point that what we're seeing as much as anything else in my view is a failure of management, it's a failure of strategy, and it's certainly a failure in supply chain because through all this offshoring, we, we the consumers, wants and needs, 70% of GDP, we have become entirely dependent mm -hmm. on an offshore supply chain that as we're finding out, doesn't have a plan B. Mm -hmm. Problem. You know, that's 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 a that's a really important point, and we're going to come back to that when you said we're going to bring it up to it, the failures of the different stakeholders. And I will have a follow-up question on that one additional stakeholder. But Dr. Donellan, please um, sort of then parallel that of in terms of finance and how then it adopted into the 1990s through this consumer-based economy that then slowly led as we were going out of the 90s, even more so into a credit-based economy to support that consumer-based economy. As you know, one of those uh, vehicles was the capital markets. Mm -hmm. Please maybe can help sure. us understand that. Well, a few things were taking place in, in parallel at the same time. Let's go to China. I teach in China every year. I've been over there for the past five years. And they're, very, very smart at what they've done. They knew from a factor of production standpoint back in the early 80s and 90s that if they opened up their markets, they have the natural resources and the labor. They have the competitive advantage on that aspect. And they look for countries like the United States that has the uh, financial uh, factors because that's what we have. We have all of the money over here. So China was smart in the sense that they said, okay, if we start opening up the ability to satisfy countries by producing things here, we're going to have a new economic boom in China and it's gonna bring a tremendous amount of money. So that's one thought thinking about, keep that in the back of our mind. Consumer spending. In the United States, we've always been a spending economy. I mean, after World War II, of course, you know, there were uh, generations that saved, 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 but that kind of went to the wind after a while. It was um, after, you know, markets opened up, the world was great, we started spending and continued spending, and continued spending. Fiscal and, uh, and uh, 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 economic policies kind of supported that at certain points. The interest rates did go up, but they also went down. So there was a very good uh, environment for borrowing at one point in time. Then our government started to say, we should allow, we should make sure everybody has the opportunity to buy a house. That's the American dream. And we, the banks put together policies to support that. And unfortunately, what happened is we were financing folks that just were unable to actually support the financing that we were giving them. So debt started to increase and consumer spending started to increase. But there was no, not the, we had something at JP Morgan called VAR, value at risk. It was a modeling theory that we put together to determine the biggest impact at any point in time that a business or a society can have that would be devastating. Well, that far, we kind of would push the envelope a little bit. So risk became very, very much um, higher. And people weren't understanding that if there was an economic issue, and that would be the 2008 that we talked about before, Dave, if there was that, that jumped in, we would be very vulnerable. Of course, we turned to quantitative easing, such as the Japanese did, and just opened up the markets at that stage. So 
I think from the 90s, from the 80s to the 90s, it was all, let's spend, let's fix our homes up, spend, 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 spend. And that's the America. We are a debtor nation. And, and you know, now you, you opened the door to now as you now move from that 80, 90s, and then you just made reference to it, which mm -hmm. is, we'll say, paying back uh, for what was this over leveraging based mm -hmm. on the underwriting criteria uh, in every asset class, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as well as the liquidity during what we'll say is the both the central bank, the Greenspan era, mm -hmm. right? But also not just the Greenspan policies of this opening of extra and accessible liquidity for the capital markets. But then you also make a very important point. There's also this policy mm -hmm. uh, component, which is in the federal government level, which is a lot of people I know are always confused. They think one and the, are in the same and they're not. They're, they're actually quite different. Mm -hmm. um, and this is um, a, a question I have for both you gentlemen uh, on Professor Lasky's uh, uh, commentary about stakeholders. And, and, and let's stay with still within that right as we now enter 2008. Yeah, there was a credit crisis and a lot of people are confused, even 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 very smart people today um, that, oh, well, we can associate and compare this to the credit crisis of 2008. And this is how we're going to wind up then addressing it and going back to then some new normal. And it may take a few years as it did back then. Uh, and what I've been arguing is that you, you, you can't just look at the credit crisis of 2008 and as we then get into what will finish this conversation, which will be where we are today uh, in the pandemic itself and then post discussion. But we have to look at other crises. I think it's an amalgamate, right? And then how did policy, both central bank, I think, Professor Donnellan sort of raised that already answer to that question. But Professor Lasky, how did policy also effectuate this issue? And you may even have some commentary or additional thoughts to Professor Donnellan's point of how the central bank created that artificial uh, environment of a credit-based economy to support that consumer-based economy, which ultimately leads to the credit crisis of 2008. And then reversely, after Professor Lasky has a chance to uh, comment, Professor Donnellan, I'll reverse that paradigm. Mm -hmm. How do you believe the government policy also contributed to that credit central bank policy, which then led to 2008? You know, in, in the 80s, the paradigm that I just uh, painted a picture for you uh, earlier uh, about in, in terms of government policy, and, and let's be clear what I mean by that. Uh, we're talking about legislative action that, you know, I mean, toward a particular end. And, and again, you know, my focus, of course, is to leave politics at the door, and I'm pretty agnostic about many things. But in, in that time period, one of the advantages toward business, and it wasn't enough, but it, it certainly was uh, an attempt at, at sustaining uh, certain things, was, was the uh, government, in quotes, perspective, on uh, taxes. So for example, an accelerated depreciation schedule for capital investment, uh, 19, uh, or early to mid 80s, uh, and, and for a few years afterwards, uh, investment tax credit, an immediate 10% investment tax credit, which allowed for big investments in um, uh, you know, capital equipment, retooling lines, so on and so forth. And towards what end? Well, you know, I don't think there's much argument when we say the two pillars of our economy really are housing and autos. And if we look at housing, certainly the January numbers, I'd, I'd be afraid to open today's numbers, but mm -hmm. the January numbers, I mean, housing's been doing, uh, you know, well. Now, again, that's bifurcated into, you know, high cost housing, you know, so on and so forth. Autos is another factor, even in 2019, you know, it's, it's not been the most re robust uh, environment for autos. And, and this pandemic ought to just about finish that in, in many ways, you know, that, that's a huge negative. So that's a lot of pressure uh, on the economy. And, and, you know, some finance types, uh, some economists are arguing that this will trigger uh, at the, uh, uh, wholesale, in quotes, level, the, the firm level, the company level, uh, kind of a default cycle. And, and I think what you're going to see is firms that fall into two categories. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, we can almost categorize firms 
by debt and their debt structure. Now, there, there is no doubt that the way to survive where we are, and I guess we'll talk more about this in a minute or two, but uh, it, it is firms are taking on debt. People are taking on debt. This is how we get through an environment like this. The difference is that, you know, there's, there's uh, high grade debt, and then there's triple B and below, you know, I mean, in, in quotes, investment grade, uh, you know, debt, investment grade is triple B, everything under that arguably is junk. Well, these are the two broad categories, high grade debt, and what we would call high risk, high yield debt, I guess, uh, we could characterize it at, as, uh, in terms of high grade, you know, I mean, treasury plus 3%, that's, that's quite a spread, you know, that's, that's, that's not bad. Uh, but these are for firms with uh, arguably good balance sheets. And, and Dr. Donnellan brought up a hugely important point, liquidity. So firms with good liquidity. All right, so that's on the firm side. Uh, of course, the other, other category, the uh, high risk, high yield debt, I guess I would characterize it. Um, look, simply put, many of these firms are going to fail. Mm -hmm. and, and here's the net effect to the consumer to, you know, you and I on the street, uh, jobs, you know, we look at the last two weeks, 10 million round figures at new applications in two weeks for unemployment. I mean, th there is a uh, projection uh, that was put out by the St. Louis Fed, uh, I believe it was yesterday, that has an expectation for a 32% unemployment rate. That, that's Something. depression numbers at that point. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's approaching 50 million people unemployed. Yeah. This is the yeah. conundrum. This is, and, and uh, you know, John, uh, uh, Dr. Dunnellen, you want to jump in. Mm -hmm. The implications of this are scary because, you They're know, as scary. I pointed out, yeah. there, there was this time frame where, uh, you know, look, we, we, uh, everybody's got to buy a house and mm -hmm. some credit decisions were made. Well, now we're being forced into making other, in quotes, debt decisions. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a scary proposition, John, don't you think? No, I agree. I agree, uh, Dr. Lasky. Your points were very well taken. And, and let me just pick it up into two, two, two sections of what you're saying, two time periods. We'll say around 2008 at J.P. Morgan on Wall Street, and I'll go up to 2013 or so at J.P. Morgan. Around 2008 is when it was 2007, 2008, the, the collateralization of what you had mentioned about the low class debt, which we didn't realize was triple A. It wasn't triple A, it was like yeah. C and B. It was, it was all um, junk. Uh, that was the crux of the issue back then. We were collateralizing. I was a product manager. I, I was part of the problem. My product collateralized uh, loans to uh, my clients were Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. And every day we would collateralize you know, several hundred billion dollars worth of, of, of loans from two counterparties. Well, we all know that one day the street said, we don't trust your pricing. Where did you get this information from? And the faith in the, of the market right then and there crashed because there was no faith in the market. It's a very efficient system, but back then there wasn't. So go a little bit further. Then I left uh, for, uh, there was no collateralization anymore. And I went, I went over to the liquidity side that Dr. Lasky had mentioned about. Now we tried to do the quantitative easing, which we're doing right now. We flooded the market, which we're doing right now. But the issue is that the banks became so shell-shocked from what happened to us in the 2008 era they made it almost impossible with the regulations and the requirements for people to get houses because the pendulum shifted to the opposite side, as opposed to saying you don't really need much credit to get a great loan. Now you need incredible credit to get a great loan. That's where the issue became. We flooded the market with tons and tons of money and it just, it kept us afloat. It took us probably 12 years to get back on our feet from the 2008 era. And now where we are, it's a little bit different. As Dr. Lasky had pointed out, the unemployment numbers are staggering. And because of that, we have to be, and I call this, I call it an arc theory, to be agile, to be resilient, and be creative. That's a modeling theory that I'm working on with a friend that those companies, those schools that are able to come up with uh, a way to 
be agile, to be resilient and creative in this new paradigm, they're going to survive. But with the high unemployment, I don't know if, if, the, if the policy and the government regulation has to start looking at it. We just, $2 trillion went into the market. Where is it going? How is it stimulating the economy? Um, that's, you know, and we got other economic factors. We still got the, the Saudi Arabia and Russia issue with the oil that's hitting us. We've got the health issues of this pandemic. And we've got the supply chain issues, which we realize that we're in a major risk at this moment in the United States. So all three of these are what we'd call the great storm. They hit all at the same time. That's where we are today. And yeah. we need to and, figure and, this know, out. One of, one of the uh, major concerns also, I think, uh, and, and leveraging a little bit on what you said, well, a bad pun, leveraging, but you know, <laughs> all of this short-term borrowing, uh, mm. which clearly uh, is, is you know, the bridge forward, uh, whether it's on the corporate side or individuals and so forth uh, through, uh, you know, extended loans and grants and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, how much, and this is the big question that, you know, John, Dr. Donnellan alludes to uh, from the 2008 era, which is this time, how much debt will the markets allow? You know, I mean, what really is going to happen here? And, and you know, there's the government perspective on this as, as well. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the Fed, the central bank, uh, you know, has injected all of the accommodation it can. You know, when right. you're talking zero uh, interest mm -hmm. and you're talking, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a zero in effect reserve requirement. Mm -hmm. Well, so they've shot the bullets that they have. Mm -hmm. So everything from this point forward is going to be market driven and it's going to be policy driven. And I know, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Weiss, this is, you know, one of your big perspectives, uh, policy and, and the role of government policy, uh, uh, you know, without necessarily, uh, you know, what some would characterize as government overreach and so forth. Correct. But, but these are uh, all the uh, elements that, you know, we've got a kind of juxtaposition against each other. Uh, and, and that lead us to decisions that will invariably be accepted as, you know, as certainly retrospectively at some point as having been a good decision, having been a, a poor decision, boy, if they only dot, dot, dot. So being in that justice, just, justice position, let, let's sort of take this uh, and we, you know, obviously I, I think appropriately. So I think it was uh, Professor Lasky said that you know, each of these sort of macro level highlights that we're, we're providing on this show today, um, you know, we could, we could spend probably an entire year just up to 19, uh, uh, I'm sorry, to 2008. But sort of to, to bring it a little bit now into where we are at the present tense, which is this discussion. And, you know, we have a, still have a 22, well, we may not after this, but we had a $22 billion economy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, obviously, we all, I think, would agree that that will, will take a hit given the significance of the unemployment factors that uh, Dr. Lasky raised. But if we have to, you know, human society, economies have gone through many transitions, uh, you know, starting, starting really um, even into the Middle Ages with the trading routes through that were opened up originally by Marco Polo and how financing was done, irrespective of even religious sort of restrictions on lending money. And there were certain uh, elements of how to get around that in order to basically allow commerce to take place. Yeah? So um, we've had these existential factors and we've also had these um, economic changes and modernization uh, throughout the last several hundred years. Uh, maybe now we're at that one of those reflection points. Mm -hmm. So if we were to examine the current state of affairs, which I, I believe Dr. Lasky is strongly a policy uh, issue of how, for example, that $2 trillion should or should not have been spent. And certainly, you know, I think we could have a, a healthy debate on um, parceling out, um, you know, why the rationalization was done for certain allocations. But if we go beyond this $2 trillion, what for the moment until we can get to what I'll call the bridge loan, mm -hmm. which uh, is sort of symbol symbolizes the transition period uh, in this pandemic economic sort of discussion or model. Mm 
how would you sort of see or envision the bridge loan? And then my second follow-up question, this is open-ended for both of you to chime in, is when we come out of the bridge loan, you usually have a transitional period of time uh, in finance. Uh, for those that are unaware of what a bridge loan is, it's something that's a short-term uh, vehicle or instrument that usually will have a higher yield command and, and more restrictions. But the intention is then for the borrower uh, to be able to, at some point in time, reposition whatever it is they were doing, uh, whether it's credit-based or through improvements to assets they may have, and then be able to transition into a, a more competitive, permanent um, uh, credit facility that is um, not, not as uh, onerous as a bridge loan is. So if we sort of use that symbolism inside the structure of the pandemic er uh, situation that we're in, in a stratum, um, how, how do you see the bridge loan uh, process possibly being worked out, which from symbolism is really, we've got to get the economy started, right? And then the second part of that is when we get the economy started, what policies, supply chain perhaps is the discussion that, that I, I'd like to sort of focus on, what should we be looking at for that more tra from transitional loan to permanent more um, fluidity in the marketplace. Let, let me start it from this point. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Did I cut you off? Just if I just chime in one second, because then I want you to, to chime in if, if, if you're possible, Dr. Lasky, on, on your perspective, because I think it'll dovetail into it. I just want to give just a little perspective of Finland. I just came back from Finland because I had the Fulbright over there. And they are very much market driven by small business. Almost 90% of their economy is gig economy, small business, circular economy. So my thoughts are, and, I think, and I'll, I'll turn this over to my economist, Dr. Lasky here in a second, is that if we can continue to give these loans to small business in the United States to keep the door open, to pay for people's employment, at least keep that going. Once the uh, pandemic, the, the uh, there's a handle on, don't forget, we have to keep that in mind. We can't touch anything at the moment. But once we come to a situation where it's either fully online, where you still are having staff, that are necessary staff, social distancing, give those small, economy, those small businesses the loans that they need right now to survive. Give them the ample opportunity to take their time to repaying it, but get them that money in their hands immediately. Why? It's a knock-on effect. They're paying for their people in their places. And that's what Finland is doing right now. But I was over there from January, I saw the entire EU, how it impacted the entire EU, right in front of my eyes. And Finland was able to, for the most part, sustain it more than most countries over there. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Lasky. That's my, my view at this moment. You know, uh, Dr. Donnellan makes an excellent point, David. Uh, you know, and I'll, I'll start from this point. Uh, when I was doing my doctoral studies, there was a guy by the name of Warren Sykins who uh, spoke to our group, and uh, he was in the Kennedy White House, stayed on through the Johnson administration and part of the Nixon administration. And I, I remember he made this point, and at first I thought to myself, well, you know, there's got to be more to it than that, but it stuck with me all these years. And he said, the purpose of government is not to be efficient. The purpose of government is to serve, in quotes, the people. And, and I've wrestled with that for years. And I thought to myself when he initially said it, I said, oh, geez, what a, what a ridiculous thing to say, you know, because we hear, you know, routinely. And again, I'm, I'm trying to leave politics at the door. But, you know, we hear routinely from politicians that, well, you know, uh, government needs to be more efficient, more this, more that. His argument it was certainly antithetical to that. And I guess here's my point. It supports exactly what, what John just said, that, you, you know, in this environment, and, and look back, David, to the time frame you were mentioning, you know, 2008, so on and so forth. Remember the whole thing about Obama Motors? And, you know, I, I, again, you know, meant apolitically, but what, what was the alternative? You know, of course, there were many people saying, well, you know, uh, bail out big business, you know, Wall Street, not Main Street, so on and so forth. But uh, in, in my view, uh, you know, my humble view, uh, uh, President Obama at the time did exactly the right thing, because sooner or later, and this, this, this is 
almost a metaphor for today, but sooner or later, someone's going to pay. Mm. So if, if in quotes, President Obama had let General Motors fall or fail, well, now you've got this long line of unemployment, ultimately who pays taxpayers. Well, so, and, that, and that raises a really interesting point. And, and, I, and I think certainly even the Trump administration during the negotiations of the original $2 trillion was trying to use a little bit of that same concept with uh, keeping afloat our airline industry, Boeing, for example. The, the dynamics, though, I think are um, a little different now and how we, this pretend, not, not pretend and extend, but at least extend and wait, yeah? Well, uh, for a fight for another day. And it turned out, you know, to be a, a, a good uh, solution uh, when you think about Obama Motors, even with AIG, yeah? Um, but but it, when was we look, it was certainly a, a good decision at the time. At the time. It kept people right. employed, it, it kept productivity, I, I right. mean, as much as it could be. Right. Uh, and, and those are the same forces that, uh, you know, are, I guess our society is depending on today. You know, when you talk about, as you mentioned, a, a $22 trillion uh, economy, well, now add a couple of trillion dollars for the spending and so forth. But to John's point that, you know, small business, all right, it may not be 90% of the economy here, of GDP here, but it's certainly 60. Mm -hmm. You know, so if small business takes a haircut, which it will, how big a haircut? So either fund small business, as John mentioned it, through yeah. loans, through this hiatus function, or pay unemployment. It, it, it's and, and that's an excellent, excellent point, because, you know, even in our, in our last podcast that we did with uh, Anthony Russo and CINJ, you know, you know, given again for our listeners around the world, um, you know, New Jersey's allocation to help in a grant, which is not a payback of a loan, was only $60 million dollars up to maximum of five thousand uh, dollars for small businesses that fit a certain category and many many small businesses actually even were not even allowed into the gate for that for example those with home offices independent contractors but this is a state of nine million people so you can imagine how quickly that sixty thousand sixty million dollars is going it's a drop in the bucket so it becomes a question that if there is to be another stimulus package, because what's been done has been done, and I know there's a, a, a significant challenge and debate going on uh, both in the leadership of the Senate now that there will not be, but I, you know, I'm not posing I have the answer, but the question will become, should there be more larger scale corporate subsidies or should that money really truly be shifted towards the small businesses through the states? And, you know, John, maybe, Danelle, and, um, as we're wrapping up our interview, maybe you can talk about that. And I would like to touch upon the geopolitical implications of where this post-pandemic economics may be, which was different from the credit crisis, which is really was able to be orchestrated also with a, with a, a collaboration of central banks around the world, ultimately. At first, it wasn't there. There was some, we'll say, less cooperation, but eventually they, they sort of came together at some point in time in the trajectory of 2008. So how, how do you look at that, Dr. Nguyen? Well, from, uh, from my standpoint, it is important, yes, to keep the small business alive, but I think we should have a balanced approach on this. Uh, you know, Finland, it was an example of one particular country that had much more emphasis on the smaller businesses or medium-sized businesses. The United States is a little bit different. We have both. We have uh, all three, medium, small, and, and, uh, and large manufacturing, large consumer-based uh, uh, you know, companies here. And I'm not really sure to the extent that every one of those larger companies is in dire straits at the moment. Some of them may have quite a bit of equity to fall back on, but we should also look at them to be able to give some sort of assistance, some sort of a help. I don't know if it would be maybe um, providing short-term loans, et cetera, or dealing with them on some of the, um, uh, the tariffs that we seem to be dealing with quite a bit in this country, maybe restricting some uh, current tariffs that are hurting manufacturing right now where they are importing certain material, just to, at this moment, step back. That's all I keep saying, 
step back, look at what's going on here, not this knee-jerk reaction that we tend to do in the United States, but to get together, and we do have some really good, Larry Kudlow is a really good economist, get people together and try to figure out the best approach. Bring in Jamie Dimons, bring in people that are understanding in both of the large uh, service sector, which is the backbone of the United States at this moment. Bring them in and let's sit down and figure out what are we gonna do? And I think that back in the 2000s, et cetera, when we had those issues, many of these leaders were pulled together and to get their ideas on what to do. And I think we should do that right now. So my answer, uh, Professor, is more of a, um, a balanced approach. Mm -hmm of utilizing what funds we have. And, and that's, that's fair. And obviously, again, we, we could have a, a, whole, a whole, I think, believe it or not, discussion on what that balance approach should look like in um, a skull session, like the US would say uh, in the military world, Professor Lasky, uh, of discussions around this. So to finish um, our podcast, my, my last question, which is this geopolitical influence of the supply chain, which we had briefly discussed in the beginning of the, of the show, uh, Professor Lasky, how do you see or what should possibly be do done in terms of whether it's large multinational enterprises or, or even smaller ones that are playing within the globalized space um, in terms of their business plans, which would then be based on what policymakers think about in terms of incentivizing them, whether it be through labor or other credits? Uh, or other types of novel or innovative incentives in order to bring some sort of, and I'll use Dr. Denallon's words, balanced approach back to the shores of the United States and or its territories like Puerto Rico for manufacturing of not just um, what I know everyone now mainstream is understanding before this event, which are these essential uh, life-saving supply chain uh, goods such as pharmaceuticals, uh, intellectual property that is based in healthcare, but even non-healthcare or non-essential uh, uh, um, uh, components, but yet from the economic level, puts us in a position that is not only economically stronger, but from a geopolitical level, uh, when we're facing off with, for example, a government like China, and I'm speaking directly to its government, not its good people. Um, how how should we how should we look at this in the long term if we're talking about this long term strategy of post pandemic economics? Wow, you're right. There could be a whole show there. And John's point about balance is uh, is exactly on point. Um, you know, David, you you make an interesting point. Uh, so so. Let's take the um, uh, crisis elements off the table in terms of, all right, we, we've heard you know, on all sorts of news stations about the masks, about the gowns, about the ventilators. So, so let's take that off the table. Uh, and, and to address uh, something that you said, what other areas and, and so forth. You know, when I mentioned the difference, because Again, uh, uh, you know, firms are going to take on debt, and you've got high quality, and you've got high risk, high yield. In that high risk, high yield category, look at the sectors, and I, I'm not going to go through everything, but you know, you've got energy, you've got retailers, you know, we know that the uh, uh, the Macy's, the Coles, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you've got autos, you've got aircraft. Now there are two global manufacturers largely, I mean, there are smaller ones, of course, but the two major, the two pillars of aircraft, commercial aviation aircraft, you've got the Airbus consortium mm -hmm. and you've got Boeing. P part of this, uh, and, and again, uh, you know, Boeing for a whole host of reasons falls into this high risk, high yield category. An industry like that from a geopolitical perspective has to be supportive for, let's call it, and be kind geopolitical reasons. It's, it's the same reason that we know that cruise ships can be built cheaper in Finland, in Italy, and, and so forth. But aircraft carriers are built in Newport News. Why? To maintain that capacity and that capability. This aircraft environment, just to pick on one, 
to lose that means we lose not just the jobs and, and the support of, of all of the other jobs that uh, are on the line when a plant like Boeing closes and, and so forth. We lose the capacity to do that. Yeah. We're there, and I don't know what kind of a shot across the bow needs to be fired, but with the erosion over 20, if not 30 years of the domestic nation state manufacturing base, with the loss of that, if that's not a shot across the bow that says, look, we've got industries here that need to be protected. Yes, mm -hmm. small business, because it's certainly, you know, and whatever number anybody's comfortable with, but let's say 60% of GDP. If somebody says it's higher, I'm, I'm not arguing that's fine. But also of the major manufacturers included in the energy sector, included in the aircraft sector, retailing and autos, like I say, we already know that, and there are others. So John's balanced approach, you know, this, this idea of intervention, this idea of a hiatus, this idea of a bridge has to address on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. uh, what, because Boeing's, uh, how much is the market going to take? Mm -hmm. How much yeah. junk can Boeing right. float at this point? And the answer is not much. Mm -hmm. You know, who are the risk, risk takers that are going to, you know, allow this to go forward? You, you see what well, I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and that's, and that, you know, that is sort of why I asked this last piece at the end of the show of where we go forward, because what I, I believe is there's a, there's a divergence going on here that is a concern. On one side, as, you know, I think many of us on this podcast believe there that the capital markets will take, or, or, or capitalism as we know it today, not capital markets, let me be clear, but capitalism and the concept of supply and demand will flesh out the best and most efficient and, and the others that are not will, you know, the system will take care of itself. But I think what we're finding because of how much and what was created in this offshore um, uh, model that has been ex explained uh, wonderfully by both you gentlemen is that now on the policy level to the Boeing example, because I, I know pharmaceuticals, I think mainstream uh, folks now understand the implications of this that you know two months ago, no one even knew that most of the antibiotics huh, are made in China. Mm -hmm. uh, so now you raise the Boeing question. And in my mind, I'm thinking about, well, what about our fighter jets? What about our aircraft carriers? What about all the parts that are necessary to build these things? Um, a third one that I'll throw out there is food, mm -hmm. the production of food, whether it's even um, plant-based food, because as the world's population continues to increase, we need to have other methodologies, both technology as well as in farm management to, to create, um, you know, non, if you will, or, or, or plant-based chicken, plant-based meats, right? So all of these then tie to a very key question. And, and perhaps we will we'll leave it in the ethos of the discussion, which is on one side, we have this policy issue of the economic part of how to be fair and balanced, but the other is one of national security. For a nation state, not just our own, but any nation state, so how do we now factor what probably even 10 years ago or even six months ago, if we were having that conversation, you would have been in certain circles, you know, quite frankly, you know, laughed at and not even thought that that was something that was necessary and fits nowhere into the economic model structure. But now that we're facing this pandemic, one on one side to Professor Janellen's point is real unto itself, the virus. But on the other is that nine, not, but half the problems within or most of the problems within the healthcare infrastructure system itself to combat the virus is based on this log jam of supply chain mm -hmm. because that supply chain was not here in this country. And if you sort of convert that out of this experience, this awful experience we're all having, if God forbid we were in the middle of some sort of major conflict, would we have potentially the same exact issue? We can't get more parts for the fighter jet that we need to get flying in order to protect this country? David, let me tell you, I mean, uh, you know, and uh, I, I glanced over it, uh, you know, some of you already know that years earlier, part of my uh, service was at the Naval War College in Newport. 
and I uh, worked at the Center for Wargaming. And, you know, back in the day, we gamed all kinds of scenarios. But, you know, a lot of that and the support that went with these different scenarios was dependent on an uninterrupted supply chain. So I, I cannot underscore the importance of what you just said. If, if we look at this pandemic and the inability and the failure of, of this supply chain, uh, if we look at that as a metaphor for other areas of policy, uh, national security being one, more of a, a geopolitical perspective, meaning influence and, and you know, world behaviors and so forth, uh, it's, it's extraordinary, in my mind, the vulnerability that we currently have. And, and the solution, uh, and again, politics aside, the solution is we have to have a reliable, robust uh, uh, a supply chain, in my view, that is as immune as it can be from shocks like the current one. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, I agree. No, yeah, please, I, I, please. I totally agree with what both professors you both are saying. Uh, my views are quite, quite simple in, in the sense that there'll always be a need for made in China. That's not going away. We just need to determine specifically as a country, um, what opportunities do we see right now that we can transform almost for a transformational opportunity that we have here to look at ourselves and say, okay, what industries do we need to have a solid base in the United States? Hmm. What are they? Um, what sectors of those industries do we need right now? Let's start training people for them. Let's start building. We have a lot of money out there floating around. Put a lot of it into infrastructure. Let's build plants. Again, for what we determine is necessary. There'll always be a need to outsource. That's not gonna go away because money is money and that's what Wall Street's looking at. We just need to be able to make sure that we put the old Gordon Gecko term, greed is good to the side for a moment and focus on national instances of either security or healthcare or something that we need right now and start training, training, training. And that's where the schools come in. We're here, we'll start to prepare. Our students now will be able to go out and do these things in this new gig or whatever this new circular economy that we're gonna be coming up to. Well, don't think I, we can I, find it yet though, David. And, and uh, yeah. I don't think I, we can I, find I, it. I think, I think Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. The feed, the uh, back feed sometimes with our podcasts. Uh, no that problem. split second uh, process we all face these days. Basically, I said, I don't think we've defined what we need to do at the moment. We no, need to no, start sitting exactly. down and working on it. Yeah. And, and, and I think, um, you know, what I, what I, the takeaway from this, this show today, beyond just a perspective as we open the show with a comment about pandemic economics, and I, I, I had a sort of thought and theory, just like John, you're working on a model, but I think we may have come up with something here, which is perhaps the, 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 the modification to my idea is one that's called national security pandemic economic policy, which then defines the scope of the sectors of businesses that would fall within this umbrella that requires a certain proportion, pro proportionality of the supply chain based on whatever AI or models we run for military, for food production, for pharmaceuticals, that must be onshore or within our territory, such as Puerto Rico. And within this, I mean, use your, 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 your uh, term of art, Dr. Dallin, this arc, which I think is part of your model, mm -hmm. then education, like schools like New Jersey State University, can train and tool because there'll be already a definition within the arc of what defines those sectors and businesses. Uh, I think it's a very exciting proposition that came out of this conversation uh, and, and perhaps that could be lead to further discussions around the world about that idea because it's not just about the United States position on these things, whether you're in Europe or in other countries, you may wanna look and examine that you're not necessarily eroding away at capitalism and free markets, but rather you're enhancing their ability to conduct business in this new era, post the pandemic uh, experience, by including a national security component, or as you said, Dr. Dinellen, a fair and balanced approach 
to what Dr. Lasky said, which is how do we deal with the supply chain elements contributed into that national policy structure that supports economic growth, but at the same time protects us from the national security crisis mm -hmm. as we are facing today within the healthcare system due to the virus. So Agreed. I really want to thank both of you for taking your valuable time for showing the world uh, not only the, the depth of uh, experience our, our business management department at the School of Business offers in many different disciplines and interdisciplinary experiences through our undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral uh, programs. Um, and I look forward to uh, more additional educational discussions with some of our other fellow colleagues at NJCU, as well as we're doing on our Continuing Connecting Bridges and Borders series throughout the world that addresses these types of issues and others for global business and global affairs. And once again, thank you so much, uh, Professor Donellan and yeah. Professor Lasky for joining us today. Uh, and again, this is David Weiss from New Jersey City University and signing off on another one of our podcasts. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye now.